Hi, thanks for joining me. In the fifth episode of Harry and Meghan's docuseries, Christopher Boozy of his own company, Bot Sentinel, actually was interviewed for that docuseries and he made the claims that there was a targeted hate campaign from a small number of people on social media against Meghan Markle. And his argument was that this was coordinated and choreographed and deliberate. Now, there's been several challenges to that assertion since then. Uh, there's even pending court cases and there's all sorts of things going on. So this video isn't about refuting those claims. I'll let the experts do that. But it did prompt a thought. And I wondered, could there be a coordinated and choreographed campaign against Catherine, the Princess of Wales? Because certainly anecdotally, I have always felt that there was. And I've always felt that she was targeted in a different sort of way once Meghan Markle started going out with Prince Harry. Now I'm gonna tell you about an author I discovered, Courtney Hargrove. Now I'm not implying that she was any way part of a coordinated or choreographed campaign against Catherine the Princess of Wales. But it is interesting because she's written several pieces on William and Catherine and she's written three books on Harry and Meghan themselves. Now these books I would describe as Omid Light. They were <laughs> very affectionate towards Harry and Meghan, rather damning of Prince William and Catherine. Back then in the first book, of course, they were the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, and now, of course, Prince and Princess of Wales. Now, she's published three books, so pretty much one for every year after Harry and Meghan exited the UK. Now, I'm going to quote from some of these. They're available on Kindle. I've actually got Kindle Unlimited, so I managed to get all three books for free because they had a special on. And so while I've been sick over the last week or so, I've been lying there and devouring these books. But I've also been doing a little bit of extra research. I've been going down several rabbit holes on the internet, and it's led me the, to the conclusion that maybe, and this is just personal opinion, Maybe Meghan Markle is a bit of a bunny boiler. Now, for those who don't know, bunny boilers reference Fatal Attraction, the movie with Glenn Close, where she was unhealthily obsessed with Michael Douglas's character and by extension, unhealthily obsessed with Michael Douglas's wife played in the film. Now, of course, I'm just being silly and jokey about Meghan Markle being a bunny boiler, but having looked at Courtney Hargrove's books and having look at the real author, her name's Sarah Hamill, so she goes by the pen name Courtney Hargrove, and she published a really interesting article four days before Meghan Markle married Prince Harry. Now this is behind a paywall on Medium and I'm a member of Medium so I'm able to access it. So I'm not going to quote it because I could get done for copyright. But the general gist of the article is basically that Prince William and Catherine are pretty much horrible people and she spells out why. And Prince Harry is a ray of light. I might actually give you that quote because it's a bit of a hoot. And Meghan Markle is this savior to be for the royal family, but she's basically warning her in this article, she's still got four days to go. There's still time to get out. Now, just before I get into all that, there's also an interesting side note. I've been following Courtney Hargrove on Twitter for quite a few years, just silently. I never say anything. I'm not really on Twitter. I just use it for research purposes. And it's interesting that Courtney Hargrove, particularly around the time of promoting her books, is always eager to reshare or retweet something that is less than complimentary about Catherine Princess of Wales. She has a bit of a track record. Now, I'm seeing a change in her tone, in her feed, and this seems to coincide with many of the confirmed Sussex squad on Twitter, because many have, have even deleted their accounts, fully deleted their accounts. Now, those that remain are going back and deleting a lot of their past tweets also, they're sort of changing the narrative. They're sort of changing the spin. All of a sudden, they're becoming really reasonable and quite kind about Catherine, Princess of Wales. 
which should be something that's celebrated. But to my suspicious mind, it just brings up a lot more questions. Now, author Courtney Hargrove at her account on X One Moment Books says, I'm sad my feed's so full of hate that I can't always tell if they're derangers or Sussex squad. Now, derangers are evidently people that support uh, the royal family and Sussex squad are people that support Meghan and Harry, as you obviously know. Then she claims that the Sussex Squad used to be a pretty uniform group in terms of what would Megan do. And then she claims that those characteristics are kindness, fundraising, strong defence, but never sinking to their level, being better. And then she puts now. So evidently there's a decision to be better now. Then she goes on in another tweet on January the 28th to say, I'm seeing homophobia, fat shaming, body shaming, ugly rumours starting, gloating. Never forget Megan herself said Kate is a good person on international TV. You don't have to agree. But to spend your life posting gleefully about a woman and a mother who could be deathly ill. So evidently, Catherine's illness and recovery in hospital prompted a little bit of (laughs) guilt, prompted a little bit of examining of her conscience because she's trying to rewrite the narrative. She's trying to turn it around. And to her credit, that's great. I'm all for more kindness and empathy, particularly on X. But That did prompt me to look at what she had written about Catherine in the past. And I'm going to share a little bit of that with you because I think it has definitely helped to fuel a really nasty narrative about the Princess of Wales. So in her second book about Harry and Meghan, she mentions Prince William and Catherine's visit to Jamaica. Now, this is all very topical at the moment, as you know. Now, just personal opinion, I do not believe that Meghan Markle decided to go to Jamaica purely to promote the Bob Marley film on behalf of Paramount. I believe that she knew exactly that it would drag up comparisons, it would drag up the old news of Prince William and Catherine's visit to Jamaica. And sure enough, Omar Scobie, her dear little friend, the first thing he did was tweet out a comparison between the PM from Jamaica gleefully welcoming Harry and Meghan compared to his rather rude and humiliating attitude when William and Catherine officially visited the country in 2022. Now, I don't think that's an accident. I think it's a plan. And I think everything that Meghan Markle does is calculated to the nth degree. A video of Kate flinching, she calls her Kate. It's interesting that all the Meghan Markle friendly authors and writers always persist in calling Catherine Kate. It's just a little tell. A video of Kate flinching and pulling away from a black woman went viral for all the wrong reasons. The Duchess was slammed, and rightfully so, for blatantly recoiling when Jamaica's Minister of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport, that's a lot of portfolios, Olivia Grange held a hand out towards Kate to gesture her over to speak with her. In the video, Kate steps back, then again in the complete opposite direction from the black woman. And then she says, she goes from that, uh, a million keyboards could be heard clacking in the universe as the echoes of William's ludicrous and demonstrably untrue pronouncement hovered over the event, we are very much not a racist family, after the Oprah Winfrey interview. But then she doubles down and she says this, Kate has a history with this, and this is the part that I thought was just too blatant, Courtney, too blatant, or should we call you Sarah? There are images over the years of Kate grinning maniacally, that's what she says, and leaning into white men, 
And there are other image of, uh, images of her pulling away from black people. Really, Sarah, maniacally grinning and leaning in to white men. So like I said, this was part of her second book that she wrote about Harry and Meghan. And like I also said, it seems to be a bit omen light because she seems to have unprecedented access. One could almost say when you read these books that you could almost hear Meghan Markle speaking. It's uncanny, absolutely uncanny. Now, to be fair, the writer is from the USA, so maybe they are very similar in the way they speak. It's also interesting to see uh, the history of this particular writer, Sarah Hamill. She's written several books. Now, she wrote for People magazine and was on staff with People magazine for many, many, many years. And it broke up in quite an unfortunate way. In 2016, right around the time Meghan met Harry, which is just a coincidence, of course, she published a letter resigning for working for People magazine. And she pretty much slammed them and distanced herself from them and from the recent new management. And she was quite offended because they wouldn't let her publish an article promoting her new children's book called Underdog, which is a book for sort of teen, the teen market. And, you know, it was a damning open letter and it created quite a hoo-ha at the time. And she actually turned this damning resignation letter into a book or half of a book called Famous Last Words. Now, Sarah Hamill knew all the KP set, evidently, from her work working for People magazine and Newswork and US Weekly and all those very Megan-friendly publications. She has a lot of nice things to say about Beatrice and Eugenie, and she has nothing nice to say about Catherine. And I'll just give you a little sample. I remember watching Kate in this bar in Switzerland and thinking how I was getting paid for a job. And then she goes on to say that observing Catherine on her all expenses paid skiing holiday, she wondered what it would feel like having a credit card or a bank account that had never been filled with money from working a job. That's what she says about Catherine and basically sneers at her for that fact. Then she goes on to say that, of course, Meghan Markle is a self-made woman, always worked for herself, always proudly owner of her own credit card and her own bank account. She goes on to say that Meghan was doing serious, important charity work that lasted longer than 45 minutes, nothing to get Catherine, before charity work got her any substantial publicity points. Well, one could argue that it was a concentrated campaign to catch a prince, but that's another story. She was educated at a top university, thanks to daddy that she's since dumped, and she scrambled her way from game show girl to a well-regarded role on basic ca cable. She was dabbling in all sorts of businesses when she met Harry. Yes, the TIG, you know, the She-Ra Princess article, another sneering article about Catherine. And I think Kate, now this is the conclusion to all that rah-rah about Meghan, I think Kate is acutely aware of this, really, and evidently acutely threatened by Meghan Markle. Now, isn't this interesting that this was published four days before the wedding? So the anti-Catherine or anti-Kate sort of narrative was being pushed out there. But if we go back to when Harry and Meghan were first announced as girlfriend and boyfriend, backgrounding articles against Catherine did start to appear in the tabloid newspapers. And it's interesting because it was in such contrast to what had gone before. Now, there was a flurry of anti-Catherine articles around 2011, and interestingly, they always seemed to mention Beatrice and Eugenie. Now, I'm not implying that Beatrice and Eugenie had anything to do with this backgrounding against Catherine back in 2011. I'm sure, like the Meghan Markle era, it's all pure coincidence. It's just interesting that there was a flurry of articles, very much anti-Catherine articles, saying how she had 
had either ignored Beatrice and Eugenie, snubbed them off, usually inadvertently in some way, failed to invite them somewhere, um, invited unnecessary comparisons against her beautiful figure and her clothes compared to the then more frumpy Beatrice and Eugenie, which if you look back, back in 2011, they were definitely more frumpy. They've got a lot more glamorous. From about 2014, they've got a lot more glamorous. And interestingly, all these sort of anti-Catherine sort of articles making Catherine out to be a really horrible person did sort of dry up around 2014, which is interesting because that's when Meghan Markle kicked in with the Shira princess sneer around 2014. And then we lead up to 2016 when all of a sudden gossip backgrounding is happening. In 2017, in February, there was an article by Lainey Gossip, which has all been done to death on YouTube. But it's interesting that... Courtney Hargrove, or Sarah Hamill, points out in her article published four days before Meghan actually married Harry, that Lainey Gossip was very much aligned or familiar with Jessica Mulroney, Meghan Markle's great friend. She points out that there's obvious connection there. Now let's have a look at that Lainey Gossip article. It was all about Catherine not giving Meghan Markle a ride to the shops and it's been covered and done to death. And Lainey Gossip have actually, has actually come out and said, well, I don't know Meghan Markle personally. But a lot of people have come out and said, well, Lainey Gossip mixed in the same circles as Jessica Mulroney. And let's face it, it was announced in October of 2016, Halloween, that Meghan and Harry were an item. Four short months later, this damning blind gossip article appears stating that someone, which was Catherine, failed to give someone else, which was Meghan Markle, a ride to the shops at Kensington. Now, there could only be two people that knew that occurred at the time, Catherine, and Meghan Markle. So assuming it wasn't Catherine actually leaking an article that made herself look bad, you would then assume that somehow it got back to Lainey Gossip via Meghan Markle. Maybe she inadvertently told Jessica Mulroney about the incident and then Jessica Mulroney inadvertently shared it with Lainey Gossip and it appeared in the Gossip magazine. But when you think about it, Four months after it was announced that Harry and Meghan were an item, a very nasty, backgrounded, gossipy little article appeared via Laney Gossip that made Catherine look bad. So all of this started happening very early on in the piece. So we don't have to really rely on Meghan's obvious setting up of the racism claims against the royal family in her Oprah Winfrey interview, only to come to a head with the release of Omid Scobie's book, we don't need to just look at that. We can look a lot further back. And it would appear that someone had Catherine firmly in their sights. One of the more amusing descriptions of Harry by Sarah Hamill in this Medium article is this contrast where she observes William chatting and having fun with his friends and then she contrasts that with Harry and she says, and I quote, contrast this to Harry whose charisma and natural charm ricochets in colours through the room like a prism hung in a sunny kitchen window. Little over the top, Sarah. Bit flowery. Bit word salady, one would say. So I've got a few fun things to share with you before finishing up about Courtney Hargrove from her, volume one of her Harry and Meghan book, which covers the first year of their life in Melodrama Cito. And she actually says a lot of things that are quite behind the scenes, including a tweet that Meghan made to Oprah Winfrey. One wonders how she would have got access to that 
information. Rather than interrupt bedtime by turning on the TV or trawling social media, Megan texted Oprah with the most casual of inquiries. <laughs> yeah, sure. Really casual. Putting Archie to bed, this is in quotation marks, no idea what's happening with the East Coast feed, how's it going? Oh no, it's not in quotation marks. So are we to assume that that's made up dialogue? Evidently, Oprah wrote back right away. Interesting. I don't either. From what I can tell, it's going well. I know it's airing. Aren't they unbelievably casual, both acting like they're not watching it? <laughs> Courtney Hargrove also makes this assertion in Volume 1, was the fact that no one from the firm corrected the story about Megan making Kate cry, using Kate because they always call her Kate all through the book. That was the reason or part of the reason they left England. Now, the narrative has changed a lot over the years, as we know, because I'm, I'm sure Megan's one whose story always evolves, especially depending on how they feel at the time and who they're talking to. She also quotes Gail King, and, and I forgot about these quotes, and this is quite ominous, really. Gail King's waxing lyrical about a sweet, what a sweet and caring person she is post-Oprah Winfrey interview. And then she says this, and I didn't realise she says this. Now, this is, is in quotation marks. King said, and as I say, Megan has documents to back up everything that she said on Oprah's interview. Everything. End quotation marks. Now, I forgot about that. I think I was aware of her saying that at the time in an interview. But when you look back, knowing what you know now, it seems even more ominous, doesn't it? There's many grandiose claims about Meghan Markle all throughout this book, and I will not bore you by reading them all, but there was one that stood out in particular. She left as a working actor and activist and returned an influential duchess with a track record of doing good in the world. Track record as a duchess of doing good in the world. Really? Really? She doesn't spell out what that track record is, but I couldn't find any evidence of a good track record while she was a duchess. It was extremely brief. I mean, blink and you'd miss it. So I've presented you with a sort of a mishmash of stuff from Courtney Hargrove, who is, like I said, Sarah Hamill. But it's just interesting to me that all those sort of Meghan Markle-friendly publications, Sarah Hamill actually worked for most of them over many, many years. She is a, an acquaintance of Beatrice and Eugenie, um, and like I said, can't say enough good things about them. Um, and also just the fact that she published this really weird article four days before their marriage, Harry and Meghan's marriage, and then going on to write these in-depth, very detailed books about their life in Melodrama Cito and her Twitter feed walking back any anti-Catherine rhetoric. It's just really interesting, isn't it? And I'm just observing it all and going down rabbit holes and wondering what's connected and what's not. But it is clear to me that the anti-Catherine narrative definitely, definitely coincided with the arrival of Meghan Markle to the royal family. Now, whether we are going to see a continued narrative that is anti-Catherine will be very interesting. I'm wondering whether the giant cleanup on X at the moment is somehow designed to end it. I don't know. But then, like I said, the very provocative trip to Jamaica, which I don't think had anything to do with Hollywood ambitions and had everything to do with dragging up a negative narrative once more about William and Catherine. And look, if Omen hadn't have tweeted that tweet, maybe I wouldn't think that. But the fact of the matter is, he did. 
Now, if he did that without any form of authorization from the Harkles, he must be the bane of their life at the moment. They must be desperate to try and control his output now. Anyway, let me know what you think down below and I'll be back with more very soon. Bye.